today we have Mark Rendell and uh, Automate Yourself Out of the Job with the Roseline. Um, we have already introduced you, um, but now, Mark, could you please say how this day is treating you? How are you today so far? I, I am fine. I, it's, it's still quite early in the morning here. It's only quarter past ten. Um, I got up. I had, I've had uh, a shower. I, I'm on my third cup of coffee. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm ready to go. And, okay. Uh, okay. So, Mark, uh, virtual stage is yours. Let's get this party started. Okay. So, thank you everyone for coming to my TED talk. Um, yeah, we are going to write code that writes code with Roslyn. I change the title of this talk sometimes, and I've obviously got mixed up with my slides. But yes, we're going to automate ourselves out of a job with Roslyn. So let's start off by talking about what is Roslyn? Um, apart from where the squiggles come from in Visual Studio. Uh, so Roslyn is the C Sharp compiler. Um, it's also the VB.NET compiler, but I don't think anybody cares. Uh, but it's the C Sharp compiler, and it's a compiler as a service, which means you can include it into your code and use it to do interesting things with your code. Um, and it takes care of all the parsing and tokenizing and abstract syntax trees and everything for, for C Sharp. Um, and I learned it because I have been working for a while now on a, a thing called Visual Recode. When Microsoft announced .NET 5 and said that WCF would not be coming to the new .NET, um, lots of people got very upset and Microsoft said, use gRPC instead. And I thought, I wonder if I could use Roslyn to automate translation from WCF to gRPC. And so I, I jumped in and I had a, a play around. And it turned out that I could. And so I've turned that into a, a product. Um, but along the way, I've learned an awful lot about Roslyn and, and how to use it and, uh, and how not to use it. And so that is what I am going to share with you in this talk today. Um, just enough information to get you started to show you uh, the basic principles of Roslyn and, and how you can use it uh, to help you with your day-to-day -day work and hopefully not to build um, Visual Recode because I would much rather you bought it from me. So Roslyn consists largely of some NuGet packages uh, and you can get these from, um, from NuGet, just include them into your project. Uh, the, the primary ones are, there are workspaces packages. Um, so microsoft.codeanalysis.csharp.workspaces. And that brings in microsoft.codeanalysis.csharp. And so this is the, uh, the package that understands C-sharp, passes it, and turns it into effectively a DOM, like a document object model, but for C-sharp code instead of XML or HTML. Um, and we also have a workspaces.ms build which understands the Visual Studio um, project model. So it understands solution files and project files. Um, and then we have a couple of other ones in there. There's microsoft.build.locator and nuget.project.model, which we'll talk about as we go uh, through the examples in this talk. So we start off with workspaces and Roslyn workspaces um, this is kind of your top level. So this is above the solution even. Uh, a workspace is effectively, think of it like a virtual Visual Studio instance. Um, and so it's what the solution is loaded into. Uh, and we have three kinds of workspace available. Um, we have an ad hoc workspace, uh, and this is one that you can create in memory, and you can just load some assembly, load a, a project in, and load some assemblies into it and then generate code or, uh, or use it to read code. And we have um, MS Build Workspace. And this one allows you to load a solution file or project files and automatically handles all the passing of those files, importing references and uh, NuGet packages and so forth. And then we have the Visual Studio Workspace, where if you're working with the Visual Studio SDK, you will get an instance of the Visual Studio workspace from the SDK. It's a lot like the MS Build workspace, um, but it's got a few extensions and it's specific to Visual Studio. So it only works in Visual Studio. You can't use it in, in like VS Code or Rider or anything like that. And 
regardless of where you get this workspace from, they all look pretty much like this. So at the top level, you have a workspace. Then you have a single solution that's loaded into the workspace. And then the solution obviously has projects um, that are loaded in there. And the projects have documents. And the documents, uh, C-sharp files are documents, but also any other files that are included in your project are also treated as documents. And we'll look at how you can tell the difference between C-sharp documents and non-C-sharp documents uh, in a little while. So the MS Build workspace is um, the easiest one to work with. You just create a workspace, load a solution into it, and you are up and running. But there is a, um, some interesting uh, issues with that that you have to work through first. And this is where msbuild.locator comes in. So when Roslyn uh, creates an MS Build workspace on your machine, uh, it has to find the MS Build um, instance that you want to work with. So that could be MS Build 16 that was installed with Visual Studio, or it could be the MS Build environment that came with the .NET 5.0 SDK, if you've installed that yet, or the .NET Core 3.1 SDK. Um, and so MS Build Locator lets you basically just say, hey, find the default uh, MS Build instance for my current um, environment. And we do that by calling uh, MS Build Locator .register defaults, um, which is included in uh, Microsoft Code Analysis workspaces common in the Microsoft Build Locator package. And then we can create an MS Build workspace um, from that, or if we have a Visual Studio workspace, this happens by uh, magic. The reason I'm kind of going through this in a bit of detail is because there is a, a slight issue with it. There is some badness, and that is if you create a .NET Core project or a .NET 5.0 project using um, Roslyn, you can't load the old style projects. So the big long CS proj files that weren't designed for um, direct editing from Visual Studio, um, it just can't load them. It, it, because those projects try to run actual .NET framework code uh, through their targets files, that will fail and none of your references will apply and it will say things like I can't find system.void and I can't find system.string and I can't find these various things, um, which is a real pain because it means if you want to write code that deals with old style projects like, for example, WCF projects, you have to write the code in .NET 4.7 or 4.8, or at least that was the code case until I got so fed up with writing .NET 4 code um, for Visual Recode that I actually created a NuGet package called Legacy Workspace Loader, which is on NuGet. Um, and you can use this, and this will allow you in .NET Core 3.1 or .NET 5 to actually load old style solutions into a .NET Core or .NET 5.0 project. So I'm just going to jump to my code sample here. Um, so this is my console application where we're going to be looking at some samples for Roslyn. Um, and you can see here, um, I've got my async task main. This is a .NET 5.0 application. Um, and I've got my MS build locator, register defaults. Um, I've got my workspace. I say MS build workspace dot create. Um, I set a, a Boolean property here, load metadata for reference projects, and I set that to true. Um, so that says just any projects you find referenced in the file or from the .NET framework type in this instance, because we're working with a .NET 5 sample project. Um, and we have a workspace failed event um, that we can add a handler to. And it's really, really useful to do this because any messages that come up when it tries to build the project in background will be sent through to this event. And so um, otherwise it will just fail silently and it will say it's done it. So if I say 
um, workspace.open solution async, it will open it. It will just do the best job it can and you will end up with something incomplete. And so by setting this event handler, you can check what went wrong here. And you can see the event handler down here and we can see diagnostic kind and this can be either failure or warning. And so if it's a failure, I'm just going to write that out to the console um, or log it somewhere useful. OK, so let's talk about <coughs> syntax trees. Um, syntax trees are the, are the lowest level um, interface that Roslyn gives you to look at code. Um, and at the base, you have a syntax tree and you also have a syntax node. Um, so the syntax tree is a kind of in memory past tree. The syntax node is um, effectively this is where the DOM uh, of C sharp comes into play. So nodes have child nodes and sibling nodes and parent nodes. And you can traverse through nodes uh, using various techniques that we'll look at. And then you have syntax tokens, and that's things like identifiers and keywords and uh, braces and parentheses are all tokens. And then you have syntax trivia. Um, and syntax trivia is things like leading white space, trailing white space, comments, anything that's not actual code um, counts as trivia. Um, so we have trivia around things. And syntax trees can be kind of difficult uh, to, to learn and they are extremely complicated. And so when I was getting started with Roslyn, I found a lot of use for the VS syntax visualizer in Visual Studio. So this is um, automatically installed in Visual Studio if you have the VS SDK components installed. So when you go to the Visual Studio installer and you're choosing the components, if you choose the Visual Studio extension development workload, then this is one of the things that will be installed. And I'm just going to show you this um, in action here. So here's the, the sample application that we're going to be working with today. <clears throat> and here's my program.cs file. And on the right hand side, I've got the syntax visualizer. And as I click around in my code here, you can see the syntax visualizer is jumping around over here. So I have my namespace declaration right at the top here. And the names, and this also works the other way around. So you can see it's highlighting code on the other side. So my namespace keyword and my identifier name, which is a syntax, which has an identifier token and then an end of line trivia and then an open brace token. And so if you want to find out, you know, what is this greeter.greet thing here? I can say, OK, so it's an identifier token and I can move back up and I can see that's a simple member access expression. And so if I wanted to find that in my tree, I could go searching for simple member access expression syntax and I would be able to find that like that. So that's that's a really um, easy way to get started. And no matter how complicated your code is, you can just pop open the syntax visualizer, move to the bit of code that you're interested in and say, OK, what's that I'm looking at and all the properties for that particular syntax node are down here as well. So you can see the um, name here is right line and the parent is this whole statement here. So that's a really good way to get started. So there are multiple ways of navigating around syntax once you've got it loaded into memory. Um, and the simplest one, the first one that you'll probably start with is the link API. So this looks an awful lot like working with an XML document using link to XML or working with HTML using something like angle brackets or angle sharp. Um, so we've got things like descendant nodes and then we can say of type to filter that down to specifically class declarations or something. And we have first ancestor or self and so that will look back up the tree to find the namespace declaration syntax. So I'm going to um, just jump over to my syntax query demo in the code here. Um, and we have uh, some very straightforward code. Um, so we pass in our solution. So this is the solution that we loaded into our workspace. 
and then we can go through uh, the projects and we can select the documents from the projects um, and then we can say uh, get the syntax root from this document so this is where we get our, um, our syntax node so that's the the absolute top level and within that syntax node we'll have things like our using statements and namespace declarations um, and then below those our class declarations and so forth. If um, the if Rosalind can't get a, a syntax root like for example it's not um, a compilable document then root will be null and so we can just continue on and then we can just traverse through all the nodes below that. So root, uh, a syntax node, has um, child nodes and those are the nodes that are direct children of that node. And so um, <clears throat> that only goes down one level and we have descendant nodes which goes through all the nodes from that level downwards. So if we go through descendant nodes and we can specify the type that we're interested in, um, by using of type, which is just the standard link of type. So if we go get me all the descendant nodes where the type is base type declaration syntax. And so <clears throat> this is uh, the abstract base class for interface declaration, um, enum declaration, class declaration, uh, struct declaration, all the different uh, types of probably record declaration, I guess now in, um, in C sharp nine. That's new and exciting. Um, I'll be talking about that next year. And then we can go up from the base type declaration syntax and find the namespace declaration syntax. So we can find the namespace that the um, type declaration is contained in. And then we can get the type name from the type declaration syntax that has an identifier, which is a syntax token and syntax token uh, has a text property uh, which contains the actual value and so type name from a type declaration syntax will be the class name or the interface name and then namespace name um, has a namespace declaration syntax and then that has a name syntax and then from that we can get uh, we can get this, the value just by calling to string and then we can just write that out with namespace name and type name like that. So if I switch to my console and I do dot net run and this will find, uh, no it won't, it will crash. Interesting. Index was outside the bounds of the array at line 20. Oh no, that's right. <laughs> um, I didn't pass in run dash d colon backslash talk backslash sample sample dot slm so you can see there that's found sample dot program and sample dot library dot greeter which are the two classes in my um, project here uh, that i was looking for um, using this fairly simple uh, link to uh, link to C sharp effectively, um, which is pretty cool. OK. So there's another way of walking through code, um, which is a C sharp syntax walker. Um, and so this, if you're familiar with the visitor pattern, um, this works by uh, you pass a syntax node into it and it just automatically calls methods that you've overridden, um, passing in all the nodes from that, uh, from that um, node. So we have overrides for things like visit class declaration. So each type of node has a distinct method that you can override um, that visits all nodes of that type within uh, a piece of syntax and this is uh, it's a very efficient way of running through code and you can also have um, 
sort of private members and everything in here. Um, and it's worth pointing out. So if I go to my, um, let's go to the syntax visitor demo. Um, so here I've got a list types walker, and this is a C sharp syntax walker. There is another um, type which is a C sharp syntax visitor. And they look very similar, but the difference is that the syntax walker will traverse through an entire node looking for all the sub nodes, all the child nodes and descendant nodes, whereas the C sharp syntax visitor will not do that. And so generally what you want is the C sharp syntax walker. Um, but yes, so here we have our list types walker. And this is just going to uh, provide overrides for visit class declaration and visit interface declaration. And whenever it finds one of those, it will call write, which will just do basically the same thing. Find the namespace, get the type name and the namespace name and write them out to the console. And so this does essentially the same thing um, as uh, the um, first code sample that I showed you. Uh, if I run this again, we will get basically the exact same output. But if I go to my um, syntax visitor demo, you can see here we just create a, a new list types walker and then for each document get the syntax root and then we just call walker.visit. Um, there are two ways around you can call that as well. You can either call walker.visit um, or you can call root dot I thought you could call root.accept. Anyway, you can call walker.visit. Um, so, yes. So that is how you can walk through syntax and you can go and you can look through, um, if you look through the syntax visualizer in Visual Studio, that gives you an idea of all the different um, types that are available, the class declaration syntax, interface declaration syntax, They're, the APIs are pretty well documented on Microsoft Docs, um, but there's not a lot of guidance on how to actually use them. I'll give you some tips on ways to do that. Um, but if I do autocomplete on the override here, you can see we've got visit uh, for all sorts of things in here. I mean, there is basically the whole of C sharp is rep represented in this API. So we've got visit return statement, select cause, shebang directive, size of expression, where clause. So it will drill down into everything. Um, you can look through things like XML comments um, and XML C ref attributes and uh, so forth. So it, it covers the whole of the C sharp language. Um, and just, you know, jumping around in Telesense was a, a lot of the way that I learned um, what Rosling could do and how to achieve certain things. But these syntax nodes are not giving us an awful lot of information. They are literally just the raw syntax and they're lacking quite a lot of, uh, of information. You have to kind of move back up to find out the namespace of a type. And that works well when the type is declared in the code that you're actually looking at. But sometimes you'll be browsing through a tree and you will find a, a type name that's maybe the name of uh, the type of a property or a field or a parameter being passed to a method. And that could be string, it could be um, dictionary, it could be uh, customer and you it will be difficult to find out sort of what the namespace of that type is, just to narrow that down, um, is very difficult. You can go back up to the using statements and you can find all the usings and then you can kind of go, okay, so which one of these using namespaces um, is contains this type and try and pass all that yourself. But that is extremely um, challenging. And so we have a, a higher level representation, a kind of more um, 
detailed representation of what these nodes actually mean and that is semantic models and this is the really powerful um, feature of Roslyn is that it doesn't just provide the syntax tree it provides semantic models that let you know what that syntax tree actually means um, without semantic models I wouldn't have been able to write visual recode it would just have been um, it would be possible but I would have given up because I'm quite lazy and and I, I don't um, like writing code myself if I can actually avoid it. So semantic models provide you effectively compilations um, and models which then let you make sense of the syntax trees that you're looking at. So we get a compilation. We can go to the project that we got from our workspace or our workspace, we to our solution, then we have a project and we can say, hey, give me the compilation for this project. And that effectively builds the assembly um, and all the types and, and everything within that project are resolved and annotated so that you can see is that system.string or is it my.utils.string and so forth. And once we've got the compilation, we can get the semantic model for any syntax tree, whether that comes from a document or whether it's a part of a syntax tree within a document or even just a syntax tree that we've created um, in a string and and passed in memory um, and we can say to the compilation give me the semantic model for this syntax tree and then from that model we can retrieve symbols um, and symbols provide us with more detailed information so from the uh, from the model we can say give me the symbol info for an identifier name or give me the symbol, the type info for an expression. So an expression being something like um, uh, var x equals 42. And if we called get type info on that, it would give us back a, a type symbol for uh, system.int32. So this um, in our code, we're going to go to our symbol demo and we're going to use um, our uh, semantic model to display information about the types that we have in our project. So we start off in roughly the same way, we go through our projects, but then for the project we call get compilation async. <clears throat> Most of the um, these methods that actually do something like compile or whatever uh, asynchronous because this is designed to be used inside Visual Studio and so they didn't want it blocking on the AI thread. Um, so once we've got our compilation, um, if the project couldn't be compiled, then that will be null. So we just want to carry on. Um, and then we can go through each of our documents and get the syntax tree for that document and then create the semantic model from the tree. So this is coming, this is getting the syntax tree and this root get root async is getting the base node for that tree. Um, so we get our model there. We know that model will not be null because our compilation has worked and we've got a valid syntax tree. So the compilation will have to be able to return a model for that. And then we can, so we still use the syntax navigation to move through the code, but then um, once we've got our type declaration syntax, which is the interface or the class or whatever, we can say model.getDeclaredSymbol and we can pass the type declaration syntax in there. So that will return an iNamed type symbol. So whether it's a class or a, a struct or a record or an interface, it will come back as an iNamed type symbol. And then here we can say symbol.typekind. Symbol.typekind will be um, what type it is. So if we go uh, symbol.typekind equals equals typekind dot. So you can see here these are the type kinds that are available class, delegate, dynamic, function pointer. Um, not seeing record in there, but. Who knows? 
Um, so we can write out what kind of symbol it is. And then from here, we no longer need to go back up and find the namespace because the symbol knows what it's containing namespace is and it knows what its name is. And so the symbol has much more useful information on it. Um, it's got, we can see all the interfaces that are um, implemented by this type declaration. We can see the containing assembly, the containing model. Um, if it's contained within, if it's nested in another type, then we can get the containing type. Um, we can uh, find its interfaces. We can also call get methods, so we can say get attributes to find the attributes that are on this type. So at this point, you may be thinking this looks a lot like reflection, and it is. Basically, anything you can do at runtime using uh, get type and reflection over that, you can do now from Roslyn um, using symbols, which is really, really cool. Um, so one thing we can do, for example, is we can say, uh, hey, get members, and then some of those members will be of type I method symbol. Obviously, some of them will be like I field symbol, I property symbol. Um, and then on the method symbol, we can say, if this is not implicitly declared, so the method symbol, again, has uh, lots of method specific um, attributes and, and properties and so forth. And you can see we've got get attributes and so forth. But we also have things like a parameters collection and uh, a return type collection returns void and so forth. One of those is um, is implicitly declared. So if this is a by default, um, Roslyn will just include methods that are generated by Roslyn, which is a bit weird. So for example, if you have properties on your class, then the get and set methods that are generated will be returned from symbol.getMembers. So I don't want to display those in my output. Um, so I say if not method symbol dot is implicitly declared, then write method symbol dot name. And if I jump back out to my code here and we'll run this again and we'll see that the application has got uh, sample dot program, um, which has got a method called main and an ask name and sample dot library dot greeter, which has got the special method dot ctor. So that's uh, what constructor functions are, constructor methods are actually called, and greet, like so. And so this is a much easier way to look at and understand your code um, than just diving around in syntax trees. So the symbol um, way of looking at your code, the semantic model way of looking at your code, also has a visitor class, and that's called symbol visitor. Um, and it's less useful, but it's in there, and so I want to sort of show you and, and talk about it quickly anyway. And so symbol visitor, um, if I just close tabs to the right, because we're getting a bit busy. Symbol visitor um, here, uh, this is a, an alternate way to do the previous thing, and with this, Excuse me just one second. <coughs> That's a disturbingly dry cough. Um, so here, we're not actually navigating through the syntax trees at all. Um, we are just, uh, we get the compilation from the project and then the compilation exposes a global namespace and everything within that compilation, within the global namespace, you've so that's, um, if you've ever written global colon colon as a namespace qualifier in C-sharp, it's that. It's the absolute top level. Um, and the I namespace symbol has an accept method on it, and we can pass the visitor into that. And so we can literally just go, hey, run this list types visitor on everything in the entire project all in one go. So let's go and look at what this list types visitor is doing here. Um, so uh, I'm overriding methods. Again, this is just like the syntax visitor or the syntax walker. Um, I override visit namespace, I override visit name type, I override visit method. 
But the difference here is that this is a visitor and not a walker. And as I said, with the syntax visitor and syntax walker, um, the walker descends through all the nodes. The visitor only does one layer and symbol visitor only does one layer as well. So um, as we go through here, we have to call accept. So here, for example, we're saying for everything in our namespace symbol, we're going to get all the members within this namespace symbol, and then we're going to call accept and pass this visitor into that as well. And the way symbols actually work is that each namespace symbol represents one layer of namespace. So if, for example, you're looking at system.collections.generic.listofT, then you will have a namespace symbol for system, and that will contain a namespace symbol for collections, and that will contain a namespace symbol. And so we have to keep calling accept um, and passing the visitor through to get this to recurse down through the tree. Um, so we say for everything in this uh, symbol, whether it's a namespace or a type uh, declaration or some other top level code, we're going to call accept again. Um, when we see when we find a named type, then visit name type will automatically be called. Um, <clears throat> and then we can just say console.writeline system symbol.containing namespace symbol.name, go through get members. Um, and then we have uh, to go through that named type symbols members and call accept on that as well. And then when we get to visit method, um, we can just say if it's not implicitly declared, write out the method name. <clears throat> we don't want to move down into the method. Um, and so we don't have to call uh, symbol doc get members and accept within there. So um, let's jump back to our command line and run this again. And we can see we get the same output from that, um, just with some different code. There's a couple of points I want to make about this visitor thing, though. So you'll notice that I've got this um, hash set of I named type symbol up here. And um, I'm within my visit named type uh, method here. I'm saying if we've already seen this symbol, then just return straight back. Now, if I comment this line of code out and go back and run this command again, just clear the screen to make that a bit simpler. Um, so if I run this now, you'll see that we get program, but we actually get greeter twice. And the reason that's happening is because the first two are coming from the compilation for the program project, uh, from the sample project. And then the second one is coming from the compilation for the sample.library project, which contains the greeter class. And the reason for this is that the compilation for the program project includes everything from the sample library project because that project was referenced. And so it's all included in there. Um, and so library greeter gets shown twice. Um, this one came from the sample project and this one from the sample library project. And actually, I can show you how this makes a difference even more clearly. Um, so let's uh, go up here. You'll see I've got these check methods in my visit namespace and visit named type, where I'm saying if symbol dot declaring syntax references dot length equals zero, then return. Um, and this is saying, hey, is the code that defines this symbol actually included in the project. If I can't find the declaring syntax references for this, then it's not a type. It's not one of my types. It's not part of my code. If I take these ifs out here um, and run this again, you will see that this way of uh, traversing through the code will find every single type that is referenced in the entire application. Um, the all the framework types, all the 
uh, BCL types, any NuGet packages that are included, everything will be found like that. Sometimes, obviously, that's what you want. But um, what that does mean is that you can get the I named type symbol for list of T and for string and so forth. Um, and sometimes that's great, but sometimes you want to be able to um, pull that out. Sorry, did I just hear somebody? I thought I heard somebody on my headphones. OK. So let's take a look at a slightly more advanced um, example very quickly. Um, just going to show you how to find all the types that are used uh, within a type. And so this is going to go into um, Tendencies demo and we're just going to do list all used types. So here um, I'm going through my project and for my uh, I'm finding all my documents. Um, and I'm going to get the semantic model. Um, for my code here, get the root. Um, and for each named type symbol in get types, I'm going to add. So this is uh, <coughs> finding all the types that are used within this document. So here I've got my get types method here, and you can see that I'm finding uh, descendant nodes and I'm finding identifier name syntax. So that's um, any uh, identifier. This could be a uh, a class name or an interface name or a method name um, or a property name and then I will get the symbol info for that identifier name and then I will just filter that to only named type symbols and then I'll do the same thing but with expression syntax so these are the two things that could be named type symbols within a, a, a syntax tree um, either an identifier name or an expression syntax. An expression will, could be a literal, it could be a method that returns something, it could be an assignment. Um, and I'm just going to return those two sets of types back. Um, and then I'm going to add the containing namespace and the thing here to a hash set and then write those out to the console. So let's save that and switch back to here. And there we have my, you see we've got sample library greeter, we've got system.console, system.boolean, system.char, and so forth. Um, all this code um, is on GitHub, and I will be putting a link up um, on the last slide, so you'll be able to go and download the code to play with. So don't worry if you're um, getting lost or your notes are getting uh, left behind. OK, so let's talk about rewriting code. Um, because rewriting code is uh, obviously trickier than understanding code. And to talk about that, we need to talk about Roslyn and immutability. So what things in Roslyn are immutable? Uh, basically everything. Everything in Roslyn is immutable. If you change it, you don't change it. You get a new copy of it with the change made. And that applies to the solution and projects and documents and syntax notes. And so um, it's there are methods in there to say replace this syntax node um, or replace this uh, this identifier token or add some trivia but it doesn't change the existing syntax node it returns back a new one and so if you tried to write code that changes syntax nodes it's extremely difficult to keep all that in line um, and so really the only way to effectively make changes to syntax when you're working in solutions and projects and documents is to use a C sharp syntax rewriter. And this um, looks uh, a lot like a C sharp syntax visitor, except instead of, or a syntax walker, except instead of um, returning void. Yeah. Um, Instead of returning void, a syntax rewriter um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
string literal upshifter. Um, a C sharp syntax rewriter. Uh, you have visit literal expression. Um, so this upshift finds all the string literals in a project and just adds two upper invariant to the end of them. And so a syntax rewriter takes a syntax node and returns a new syntax node. And so this lets you change syntax within a tree and um, Roslyn takes care of handling the immutability and applying things in there and everything else. And so um, our upshift all strings um, finds the documents uh, and then passes through the, uh, creates an upshifter with the model that came from the get semantic model, um, calls upshift.visit and then we have our new solution here. So new solution starts out as being workspace.current solution. Um, we can then change that. We get our new root here and we say if new root has, if the document has changed, then new solution equals new solution with document syntax root. So this basically recreates the entire solution with this new document syntax root. Um, and you pass in the ID and the new root to say change this document in its project to this new one. Then down here we can say if the solution has changed, um, so if our new solution doesn't equal workspace.current solution, then we can say workspace.tryapply changes new solution. And so if I just jump out to um, the code here, uh, that will run and it will say one change is applied. And if I jump back to my um, project here, and you can see that it has added to upper invariant to the what's your name uh, value here, uh, but it has not added it to hello dollar name here because this is not a string literal expression. This is a interpolated string expression and I didn't touch those in my code. Sorry, I'm, I'm running low on time, so I am going to have to um, cut this a little bit short. Um, you can put all of this together in analyzers and there's a diagnostic source usage analyze that I wrote that basically checks that your diagnostic source use is correct, that you are checking to see if a diagnostic source is enabled before you um, call it, which is something you should definitely do. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's a Visual Studio project template for this, which has an analyzer with a code fix. Um, and uh, there is, uh, you can create an analyzer and you can also create a code fix provider. And I will show you a link to an analyzer that I wrote, um, which you can go and explore <coughs> and maybe ask me about. And at some point I'm meaning to do a YouTube video about it. Useful resources. Um, I found Josh Varty's Learn Roslyn Now course extremely useful. Um, that was very, very helpful uh, when I was learning Roslyn. Um, when you're working with analyzers, there are some great real world examples to crib from on github.com slash dotnet analyzers. Uh, Visual Recode is my project that migrates .NET 4 um, WCF to .NET Core 3.1 gRPC um, and also provides various other helpful uh, utilities. Um, you can find the code from this uh, talk at github.com slash visualrecode slash buildstuff2020 and you can find my diagnostic source analyzer at rendellabs slash diagnostic source dot analyzers. That is it for the talk. Um, I hope that was helpful. I will be in the question and answer room um, now uh, for anybody who has any additional questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Greetings to UK and um, I hope that you will. we all will get out of this 2020 uh, <laughs> together. And um, and yeah, that's about it. So I hope that you're going to have a very good day and uh, see you next year. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Bye.